He hung out over here, exposing himself, fondling himself. And I was really appalled when he went into the dressing room. Tuesday, January 5th, shocking charges is a rapist stalking shoppers at a popular store. Also at show and tell time for Amy Fisher, wait till you see what she's showing. And meet a robber who's all stuck up, in the chimney that is, and this is no Santa story. Good afternoon everyone. First today, a child killer dies on the gallows at a Washington state prison. Wesley Allen Dodd says he deserved to die for murdering three little boys, and he chose death by hanging. Well, you have time to do a lot of thinking. Uh, you realize exactly what it is you've done. This is a man who, when he meets his God, has a lot to answer for. You heard the pop and, and saw the body come down. We should never celebrate a death. This is what Dodd wanted. And so Wesley Allen Dodd met his maker just after midnight. Richard Roth has more on the nation's first hanging since 1965. As the clock swept past midnight in the Washington State Penitentiary, child murderer and rapist Wesley Allen Dodd became the first person hanged in the United States since 1965. The execution of Wesley Allen Dodd has been completed. A physician pronounced death at 12.09 a.m. Dodd was put to death for the stabbing murders of 10 and 11-year-old Billy and Cole Neer of Vancouver, Washington, and 4-year-old Lee Isley, who was abducted, raped, and hanged by Dodd. Since his arrest, Dodd has repeatedly said he wanted to die at the gallows. That's the way Lee Isley died. I don't think I deserve anything any better than what he got. Dodd ate a final meal in a holding cell, salmon, scalloped potatoes, and lemonade, and then met with his attorney. For the first time ever, somewhat, uh, he did express some remorse. He asked for, he asked for uh, forgiveness, uh, but he was also made it clear that he did not expect any forgiveness. But Dodd did not share those exact thoughts when he appeared in the window above witnesses and delivered his final words. I was wrong when I said there was no hope, no peace. There is hope. There is peace. I found both in the Lord, Jesus Christ. Look to the Lord and you will find peace. Journalists said the parents of the murdered boys did not like what they heard. And I believe when he reached the words uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ that, that uh, Claire Near hissed. Then a 30-foot rope was placed around Dodd's neck with a knot behind his left ear. It was carried out as it was supposed to be. There was no sign of a, uh, a struggle. The noose was placed around his neck um, and tightened by someone standing in front of him and someone bef behind him and dropped. It was, it was so very quick, maybe two minutes at the most. Dodd does leave a legacy. Because of his crimes, the state of Washington passed some of the toughest sex offender laws in the country. Per his wishes, Dodd will be cremated. Death means nothing to me. Richard Roth, Walla Walla, Washington. Police in Brooklyn are searching for the killer of a subway token booth clerk. He was shot to death at the Neptune Avenue Van Sicklin station. That's on the F line. That's Coney Island. A transit police officer on patrol found the man's body in his token booth at around 2.30 this morning. Robbery is believed to have been the motive for the crime. The investigation that has begun by the transit police department and detectives from the 6-0 precinct uh, has revealed so far that this clerk was shot uh, numerous times by a large caliber handgun, uh, and that a certain amount, uh, uh, an undetermined amount of money had been taken from the booth. Anyone who is in the area of the station early this morning is urged to call transit police. Cop shot, two words that send a chill through all of us, and it happened again this morning. He's fine. He's just the this morning, I just saw a police car's name was all over the place in the park. It was a car shot on a 54th Street. I'm saying, oh, yeah, I, was at the I have to go down there. <laughs> I work down here. <laughs> Officer Dean Zaidi was on scooter patrol in a west side park. As he questioned a couple of men, one of them pulled out a gun. He shot the officer in the hand. Both suspects ran. Officer Zaidi is listed fortunately in good condition at Bellevue Hospital, but police are searching for the two suspects. On a spring-like day, a woman is walking through Central Park. Suddenly, she's attacked. She's raped in broad daylight. Chris O'Donohue is live in Central Park 
with the latest on that. Chris? Sarah, it is a wet, gloomy day here in Central Park. Not at all like, as you said, yesterday sunny afternoon. But that was the setting for an ugly incident that can only serve to remind us of that infamous case of the Central Park jogger. Police say it happened again. Another reported rape in Central Park. I thought it was very scary. A 27-year-old woman claims she was approached around 62nd Street on the East Park Drive around 3 o'clock yesterday afternoon. She says she was forced at knife point through the park and raped somewhere in the vicinity of the zoo. The victim then went to a friend's house before calling the police. What was the scene around this area yesterday? You know, it was very busy and a very nice, unusually warm winter. And you know, everybody's having a good time around the zoo area. So it's surprising to you to hear that there may have been a rape here yesterday? Yes. Yes, it surprises me. Why? Because it's, um, it's not an area. I've worked here for 10 years, and it, this area is an area that rape usually occurs. The alleged rape surprised most people who frequent the area. Most note a heightened sense of police presence in the park, especially since the notorious jogger attack nearly four years ago. Eight youths were convicted in that brutal attack, and public outrage demanded more police protection. Police now claim more mobile, better deployed community policing in the park has paid off handsomely. In the year of the jogger case, 1989, there were 14 rapes in Central Park. In the next year, it dropped to 10, then down again to 9 in 1991. And in the first eight months of last year, the number was way down to a total of two rapes. Since the jogger case, have you noticed that anything different that, that uh, makes you feel safer? I think there's a, there's a um, constant but low-level police presence in this part of the park and this whole part of the plaza constantly. Among the changes police have instituted in the park are specially designated 24-hour robbery patrols between 96th and 110th Street, a new police post on the cross drive at 102nd Street, that's where the jogger was attacked, and more mobile community policing, especially cops and scooters. As for yesterday's alleged attack, the police so far have issued no description of the alleged attacker. Back to you, Sarah Lee. All right, thank you, Chris. Another rape case, Bergen County, New Jersey, the town of Wyckoff. As we told you exclusively last week, police there have a convicted rapist under 24-hour-a-day surveillance. He's done his time, 12 years, but they believe Donald Chapman will strike again and soon. That's what psychiatrists are telling them. And the prosecutor's office tells us they don't know how long they can keep up the surveillance. It's costing $2,000 a day. In the meantime, as we also reported last week, the state attorney general's office and lawmakers are trying to find a law that would allow them to get Chapman and other repeat sex offenders committed. A potential environmental disaster worse than the Exxon Valdez oil spill is in the making. A Liberian tanker has run aground on the coast of Scotland's Shetland Islands. Hurricane force winds reportedly forced the tanker aground. Some of the estimated 25 million gallons of oil are now leaking into the water. The bad weather is also preventing crews from getting to the tanker to stop the leak. All right, right now we want to go to Lloyd Lindsay Young for a first check on the weather. Sarah Lee, we have a spectacularly warm day again. It's incredible. 62 degrees. Uh, we've broken a record again. The humidity, 77%. Rainfall, almost an inch, 99 hundredths. What about that rain? Take a look at the radar. It's on Long Island and moving east and getting out of here. How long will this incredible warmth last? I'll have the answer in a few minutes over in Studio B. See you then. All right, we'll be looking for you. Still ahead, the brutal murder of a soap opera star stuns a nation. Also, plastic surgery for women, saving hair for men. Plus, is someone stalking women in a popular department store? We're talking rape here. It's show and tell time for the Long Island Lolita. Amy Fisher takes it off. And get this, the robbery suspect who got stuck in the chimney. Rapists may be stalking shoppers in one department store chain and raping them in the store's fitting rooms. Paul Bloom has the shocking details. In the middle of a Sunday afternoon, police say a rapist targeted a woman on the second floor of the Nordstrom store. She had been trying on clothes in a dressing room. So she left for a few minutes and went and picked out another outfit. And she went back to the same uh, fitting room and the suspect was waiting for her. The victim's hands and mouth were taped. She was raped and robbed at knife point, police say. 
but police are wondering if the suspect might have been a frequent visitor to Nordstrom stores. A man matching the description of the rape suspect may have been stalking women in both Nordstrom stores in Fashion Valley and here in Horton Plaza for as long as a year. One Nordstrom shopper says she saw him in both places. And when women would walk by, he would fondle himself, expose himself, and then cover himself back up with his shirt tail. Nordstrom says it would be standard policy to remove someone from the store in a case like that, but Nordstrom officials can't remember that exact incident. But four months ago, the same woman went shopping with her husband at the Fashion Valley Nordstrom, and there in the cafe was the same man. I followed him, and the first place he took off to was the children's department. He hung out over there, exposing himself, fondling himself, and I was really appalled when he went into the dressing room. Police are reviewing videotapes from security cameras posted near the entrances to the Fashion Valley store. They're looking for a certain man who might be seen entering or leaving the store. And they might have a shopper who has seen the same man stalking the stores for months. And police say that what they're doing is beefing up security around the stores. They're trying to catch the rapist before he strikes again. The NAACP is demanding that the thugs who set a Brooklyn man on fire be charged under Florida's hate crime law. Police say three white men carjacked Chris Wilson, who is black, outside a store on New Year's Day, then took him to a remote area, robbed him, doused him with gasoline, and set him on fire. Wilson has second and third degree burns, and the FBI has joined in the search for his attackers. Bail is set for $1 million for Stanley Zukowski. As we first told you yesterday, he's the New Jersey veterinarian from Mercerville, charged with trying to kill his five children. Doctors say two are in critical condition, three stable. Police say he was visiting them in a Louisiana hotel over the weekend when he gave them a drink laced with xylazine. That's a powerful anesthetic used on animals. Police are investigating a custody battle as the motive. Illinois' home alone parents face a hearing today on charges that they left their two kids home alone and took off for Acapulco. David and Sharon Shue were arrested when they returned to the U.S. last week. The children, ages 4 and 9, have been placed in foster care, and the parents are not even allowed to contact them. Today is homecoming day for returning members of Congress, and the first day for a lot of new members, the largest freshman class in 44 years. Skip Lozier has this late report from the Capitol. Lawmakers are hoping the monsoon-like conditions which greeted this day are not an omen of things to come. Stop getting rich on the backs of the poor. But Congress still hasn't erased the tarnish of the so-called House Bank scandal. Backwards, backwards, you know it's true. Sexual harassment just won't do. Allegations of sexual harassment and possible ethics or financial misdeeds continue to plague nearly a dozen members of Congress. Nevertheless, many people are hopeful. It's just going to be so refreshing to have people working together, Clinton and the Congress. So. But even though Democrats will control both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue, some of the big boys on Capitol Hill still haven't signed on to parts of Bill Clinton's program. They should be listening to the people. But the people want a lot from a Congress with more than 100 new members, better education and health care, more jobs, deficit reduction. And, uh, no more taxes. <laughs> but all that won't happen quickly. Not only uh, is the president-elect Clinton lowering expectations, but I think members uh, on the Hill, chairman and leaders are lowering expectations about what can get done in the first 100 days. This is the most diverse Congress in history. The House sporting more African, Hispanic and Asian Americans. And of course, more women members, including the first ever black woman in the Senate. Senate committees will begin confirmation hearings tomorrow on some of Bill Clinton's cabinet appointees in hopes that most of them will be ready to go to work by the time Clinton moves into the White House. In Washington, I'm Skip Losher, Channel 9 News. Still ahead, Lloyd's weather forecast. It's wet and warm and it's a whole lot more. Plus grief-stricken fans of a murdered soap opera star. Amy Fisher stars in a new video and it's got some X-rated scenes. And picture this, a robbery suspect stuck upside down in a chimney. Wait till you hear this one. California police say a would-be stick-up man got a little stuck up himself. Stuck up in a chimney, we should say stuck upside down. The man tried to make like Santa and slide down into a house. When he got stuck, he screamed for help. The home's owners say despite his predicament, the burglar didn't miss a trick. And I hollered, what are you doing in my house? And this voice from my fireplace said, 
I'm Santa Claus. I'm coming down your chimney. <laughs> and then I, my husband ran about that time, and he says, what are you doing in here? And the man said, well, I need to use the phone. So I just keep thinking what could have happened had we not heard him or had he not got hung. I wonder what his intentions really were. I wonder. Firefighters were called to free the alleged Santa. Police then charged him with burglary and resisting arrest. Take the stoker. <laughs> Give him a poker. <laughs> exactly. Oh, I'll tell you, Sarah Lee, it is incredibly warm. I've never seen anything like this. The, the reason? We've never had it before on this particular date. Shattered a record at Newark Airport, probably around 9.20 this morning, when it reached 64 degrees. Here's the current conditions. Here's how we're shaping up, and it is definitely, definitely unusual. Mostly cloudy skies. The rain has ended, except on Long Island, where showers are still occurring. It's 62 with 87% humidity southwest at Yo Levin, and the barometer is not 29, it's 2986. Uh, put a point eight six in there. Talking to our Chiron operator. Good afternoon, everybody. Hello, Scarlet City. Violet Johnson. Happy birthday, young lady. 81 years young. I'm proud of you, Violet. All right, look at these. These are current temperatures. Actually, uh, the 64 was earlier, but the others are current. 60 at White Plains, 61 at Islip, 61 in AC. Phenomenal, phenomenal. How long will it last? More about that in a moment. Here's the latest radar. The showers on Long Island moving out of the area. We ended up with almost an inch of precipitation. Had this been normal temperature-wise, we would have had 12 inches of snow, snow lovers. Oh, well, there goes another one. Radar, all well off the coast. You can see the larger view, scattered snow showers in the Midwest. But hey, the big story for us is going to be a big-time cool down. Partial clearing already occurring in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana. Back into Illinois, this system in the Upper Plains is not going to affect us. Chillsville, science heading our way. The front roaring through the area this afternoon. A rapid drop in temperature. Think about drops. Look at this. 16 below Minneapolis, 7 below Bismarck, 10 below Great Falls, 21 below at Alamosa. Woo! Partial clearing, rain ending on Long Island. Falling temperatures through the 50s. Tonight, clearing, much colder, 30 to 35 in the city, 20s in the burbs. Manana, sunny, much cooler, low to mid-40s. But even that's above normal. Our normal high is 37. Here's my five-day outlook. Sunny, but dry on Thursday, still above normal temperatures. Then, chilling out to near normal as we head into the weekend. Increasing clouds on Friday. Light snow, possible, Saturday. Highs in the 30s, lows in the 20s and teens. Sarah Lee, it, I honestly went golfing last night to the driving range for really? about an hour, and, and there were 18 other Meshuggahs out there. <laughs> yeah. How'd you do? Well, I, I 200 yards. Good for 61 you. degrees, why not? <laughs> Take Talk shows, TV, movies, will it ever end? Not today. Robert Miller reports. Here's Amy in a tape purportedly made less than a month before she shot and seriously wounded Mary Jo Botafuco. The tape was reportedly made by Paul Makeley, Amy's boyfriend. Apparently, that's the second intimate okay. tape of Amy that he's sold to TV. Should I do anything? I'll show you one at a time. Amy's doing 5 to 15 on a reduced charge of assault. Amy contends that her victim's husband, Joey, was her lover and that he encouraged her to shoot his wife. Amy reportedly didn't watch any of the network shows about herself. Amy said she and Joey made love on his boat. Need a break from Amy? Mary Jo and her husband taped a Donahue show scheduled to be aired Tuesday afternoon. They were asked how come Amy was able to describe the interior of Joey's boat. Our boat is next to our house. She claims that she sunbathed on the deck of my boat that's in an 88 slip marina right next to my boat. I, I see she the boat. She claimed that she went out, she claimed Come that she was on. on the boat with his children. And his yeah. children called her Aunt Amy. Give Nothing could be further here. than the truth. Why did Amy and Joey, the body shop guy, exchange so many phone calls? She wrecked her car 14 times. Right. They have also, which... And I have Bill's records to prove it. Well, right. come on. Just one more question. Um, 14 times. This. She's 17 years old. So, Amy was pretty dangerous on the highways, too. Amy's lawyer says he's disgusted by the release of the latest tapes of Amy. Robert Miller, Channel 9 News. 
Police continue to search for clues today in the disappearance of 10-year-old Katie Beers. And there's new information today on the man who may have been the last person to see Katie alive, John Esposito. He was arrested in 1977 for allegedly abducting a 12-year-old boy. Today, a report claims that in 1988, Esposito tried to convince a Big Brothers organization that it was his twin brother who had a police record, not him. His request to be a big brother was rejected and the search for Amy continues. Matthew Heichel awaits his fate. He's the 22-year-old man convicted of brutally murdering his parents in their Bernard's Township home last year. Now jurors must decide if Heichel should be sentenced to death or face a minimum of 30 years behind bars. Well, workers who clean 900 of New York City's office buildings are backing away from a strike. They were given two more days to try to work out a contract. The deadline's tomorrow morning. Wages, work rules, and job security are the major issues. Bargaining is continuing around the clock. Mayor Dinkins has ambitious plans for the coming year. He outlined them yesterday in his State of the City speech. Many of those plans rely on dedicated city workers. So Pete Fuentes went out to see what some of them think about the mayor's ideas. With these new partners, so many of them longtime friends, we can help transform cities like New York into towns called Hope. I hope things are going to get better. But when you think about it, it's not going to get better unless they really start examining what we're, what we're up against a little bit, you know, and start looking at it from our standpoint, I think. This is their viewpoint, the state of the city from people who work in it every day like fireman Kevin McCarthy. Uh, it just seems like our job doesn't seem to get that much recognition anymore. I promise to be the toughest mayor on crime in this city's history. We have to keep pushing, all right? Because if, if, if we fail, then everything else fails. This is Sal Maniscalco's beat from Washington Heights, where he helped police the riots last summer and today guarded a demonstration at the local school board. I don't think it would matter who was, who was mayor. Uh, who was governor? Who was president? I don't think it would matter one bit. I mean, as your life as, is still hard on the streets. Yeah, as long as the drug problem is here, especially in Washington Heights, it'll always have a, a bearing on anything. Our first investment must be, of course, as it should be, in our people. We must start with our children. We're on the ball as far as what we should be doing educationally. The buildings are in a very sad state of disrepair. There's not even a place for the children to wash their hands in the bathrooms. There is no proper plumbing facilities. It's really atrocious. I want to make the life of small business owners easier by finding ways to reduce the numbers of summonses issued. Can you put another line here? Yeah. A lot of people come from Jersey, from Connecticut, and they come, they come to shop here. They may not come because of the stiff fines that they're going to have over here. They have to pay $100 for a ticket. They're not going to come. In a city of millions of people, even a few voices can be heard because even a few voices matter. We can't let down on our job. Our job still has to be performed whether times are good or times are bad. And that's the state of the city. In Washington Heights, Pete Puentes, Channel 9 News. Still ahead, shock over the death of a soap opera star, plus the year's best movies. Will your list match ours? And saving you money when it comes to those through-the-mail sweet... In a bizarre case of life imitating art, Brazilians are in shock following the gruesome murder of one of the country's favorite soap stars, Daniela Perez. Her body was found by the side of a road in one of Rio's chic beachfront neighborhoods. She had been stabbed in the heart 18 times with a pair of scissors. Who could do this, says her husband, actor Raul Gazzola. Who could brutally murder a 22-year-old girl who had her whole life in front of her? The answer to that question sent shockwaves through Rio's tight-knit acting community when one of their own confessed to the crime. 23-year-old Guilherme de Padua played Perez's jealous boyfriend in Brazil's top-rated primetime soap called Of Body and Soul. As the actor was taken into custody, police had to protect him from an angry mob. A few days later, de Padua's wife, Paula, was also arrested. Every day brings new twists to this story, which is proving to be stranger than anything on TV. It's believed the couple killed Perez during a satanic ritual. Police suspect the actress was murdered because she rejected De Padua's off-camera advances and his wife took part in a jealous rage. The soap opera in which Perez appeared draws a nightly audience of more than 40 million. 
Viewers feel as if they've lost a member of the family. Thousands of grief-stricken fans turned out for her funeral. Brazilians can't get enough of this story, which has dominated the news. On the beaches, in the cafes, it's all people are talking about. It's a terrible, senseless tragedy, says this woman. We're all waiting to find out what really happened. In a country with a high rate of illiteracy and where television is the main source of information, the murder of Daniela Perez has affected Brazilians like nothing else in recent memory. With so many questions yet to be answered, this real-life Brazilian soap opera shows no sign of ending anytime soon. Marina Mirabella, Rio de Janeiro. Members of an Atlanta-based rap group are putting their money where their mouth is. Arrested Development is proving they are everyday people. The group is donating half the profits of their latest single to help the homeless. And the record label has put up a matching grant. The group's lead singer says it's easy to complain about homelessness and to point the finger, but it's another thing to try to do something about the problem. Some names we're taking note of this Tuesday afternoon, Marion Barry. The former Washington mayor is no stranger to crime. He served six months in jail on a cocaine charge, and now he's a crime victim. Barry's car was stolen yesterday while he was at a city council meeting, one of his first since being elected last fall. The car has since been recovered. Michael Jackson's in the news again. It seems the so-called king of pop also wanted to be king of the inaugural ball. He supposedly tried to convince the inaugural committee to plan just one ball featuring Jackson instead of the 10 different ones that are scheduled. The committee said no, and it'll go ahead with plans to feature Bob Dylan, the Eagles, and Fleetwood Mac. A new distinction for President Bush, the Millard Fillmore Society, has awarded him its Medal of Mediocrity. The reason? Well, according to the group, Mr. Bush did a giant belly flop into what it called the Lake of American Despair after scoring a 90% approval rating following the Gulf War. The president beat out Woody Allen, Dan Quayle, and the Postal Service. Aladdin is still making magic at the box office. The animated film is still the number one choice of moviegoers to top the list over the holiday weekend, bringing in over $15 million. A Few Good Men took the number two spot. Aladdin is also on our Pat Collins list of last year's 10 best movies, and here are her other favorites. On my runner-up list are A League of Their Own, Basic Instinct, and A River Runs Through It. What made the cut are ten movies which I think are the best in their category. So in no particular order, here are my favorite movies of 1992. Yeah. Ten thousand years will give you such a crick in the neck. Robin Williams came out of the lamp with a thousand and one one-liners to make Aladdin the hippest animated movie of all time. He may not be a movie star, but when it comes to being happy, we are Whoopi Goldberg turned it into Our Lady of the Perpetual Laugh, and Sister Act was the year's best comedy. And I'm here to kill you, little Bill. Clint Eastwood is tall in the saddle with Unforgiven an unconventional Western that was the year's best dramatic movie. The book that made the most graceful transition from page to screen was How Is End with Anthony Hopkins and Emma Thompson. The play that made the most exciting transition from stage to screen was A Few Good Men. Director Rob Reiner scored with Jack Nicholson and Tom Cruise. You want to investigate me? Roll the dice and take your chances. Tim Robbins proved you can get away with murder in Hollywood in The Player, the year's best spoof from Robert Altman. Steven Seagal was a dynamite cook in Under Siege, which delivered all the ingredients as the year's best action movie. I also cook. Mel Gibson, Danny Glover, and Joe Pesci are the kings of Sequel City. Lethal Weapon 3 left us wanting a fourth. You don't take my car then. No, you're yes, not. Yes, I am. The book that brings groans from every high school kid became the year's best romantic adventure. The last of the Mohegans also made a sex symbol of Daniel Day-Lewis. Why didn't you leave when you had the chance? Because what I'm interested in is right here. In the year of family values, only one movie got it right. 
And that was Home Alone 2. Don't you know a kid always wins against two idiots?